Okay, so welcome to our webinar this week. Um, today's title of the webinar is how to maximize, oh, sorry, how to minimize political risk. Um, political risk is something that cannot be avoided, but it can be managed, and that'll be the main theme today. Uh, investors usually take measures to lower the probability of risk affecting them, and obviously we do this to reduce the effects of it becoming a reality. So the simplest way to manage political risk is to avoid investing in that region affected by that risk. So when I say region, you can think of countries, countries like obviously Zimbabwe, countries that come to mind also would be Syria, Libya, and go so far as places like uh, Somalia. But um, it's also equally important to have a plan in place in case you do find that your investments are impacted by political events. Okay, so that's just giving you some context that, um, you know, as you can see there by the subheading, go out on the limb, that's where the fruit is. Um, that's a quote from uh, ex-president, US president, uh, Jimmy Carter. So the, the whole idea is to, to be in a better position where you can ignore the noise. We'll talk about market noise a bit later. But uh, the idea is to make um, sound investment decisions. You know, last week, in last week's webinar, we referred to the five factors that uh, are in, in a, what I call a, a perfect investment. And one of those uh, factors was what we call liquidity, be able to get your money out as, as, as soon as possible, especially when it comes to um, political risk. But obviously, on, on the one hand, we've got the liquidity, we'll be able to get your money out, but also we're looking for investments that have high returns. Um, and obviously, the higher the returns, the higher the potential risk. So um, that's where I, where I brought in this little sub-quote from uh, Jimmy Carter to go out on a limb. That's where the, few, where the fruit is. So the whole idea is about taking calculated risks. And that leads into my next quote. And this is a quote from, um, let me just get my curse in place. That's a quote from uh, General uh, George Patton. He's best known as, for his leadership of the uh, United States Third Army. That's going back in the Second World War. But uh, his quote was, take calculated risks. That is quite different from being rash. And you know, we'll talk about it in more detail. So let's put it into co the, the framework for today's webinar. Um, we'll put it into context. What is political risk? Political risk is, is the risk that investment returns could suffer as a result of political changes or instability in a country. And uh, obviously, uh, we have a lot of it in our country. Um, but I'll go into more detail just now. Instability that affects investment returns can stem from a changing government, uh, legislative bodies, uh, other foreign policy makers, also military control. We don't see so much here, obviously our neighbors and things like that. But uh, another way of looking at political risk is uh, what is known as geopolitical risk. and comes more of a factor the, the longer your time horizon is for your investment. Okay, The outcome of political risk yeah, it draws down or drags down investment returns. And as I mentioned just now about uh, liquidity, it also goes so far as to remove the, the ability to withdraw capital from um, an investment. I was talking to a, a Greek friend of mine. He remember when he was living in Greece uh, a few years ago that as, as a um, as, as an inhabitant or as a local uh, Greek, uh, Greek uh, they could not withdraw all their funds out of the ATMs. Uh, I was reading an article um, where January last year, January 2015, Greeks could only withdraw 600 euro per day from um, from the ATMs. Obviously, that didn't apply to the tourists. But imagine being in a situation where you can't draw more money than you actually need to feed families and that. Imagine what the business owners were thinking about. Okay. So... When we talk about a, a political risk, we're referring to, to uh, geopolitical risk. So let's come down to South Africa. Um, I saw today's business day, and you'll see this in every day's newspaper. Today's business day, front page news, political divisions are now South Africa's number one credit weakness, and that's according to Moody's. Um, while South Africa's low growth rate and its ability to stabilize public debt levels were key issues in the past, Moody's, the rating agency, is keeping a close eye on South Africa's political divisions ahead of remember, uh, Moody's is uh, 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 having uh, uh, a rating, uh, call it, um, they can look at South Africa and their, their position is on 25th of November. So the main thing is that government must, deliver, government must still deliver on some of its reforms that it has promised, 
if it wants to stave off the downgrade. Um, and we talk about the noise. The noise itself is not the issue. The noise is all the uh, issues around um, what's happening in South Africa. But the question is whether the noise creates division. And obviously, we're seeing that. Uh, well, us, I'm seeing that. Which impedes uh, structural reforms and also could undermine the rating. Now, this rating agency sees a partnership between business, government, and labor having a, being, uh, being positive, but they still want to see tangible outcomes in terms of structural reforms. And that's one thing I don't, I first don't see. Um, yes, we're seeing, uh, um, President Zuma taking over control of the, uh, state owned enterprises. And, uh, I'm not going to go too many details about that, but, uh, we're still seeing things. Uh, we want to see changes with regards to labor markets. And as I say, state owned enterprises, we've seen the whole for all where around SAA, how much losses they've got there. And they've just got another bailout. But uh, we bring it right down to businesses. You know, businesses are also uh, impacted by uh, political decisions. You know, there's a variety of government decisions that obviously affects the business, uh, individual businesses, the industries, and obviously ultimately the overall economy. And these include obviously taxes, spending, uh, regulation, currency valuation, trade tariffs, um, labor laws. Um, you know, such as minimum wages, and that's what's also banning around at the moment, as well as environmental regulations. I saw an uh, article today from Future Growth, um, where they're suspending uh, any further loans to the coal industry um, to, uh, on the back of um, sustainable environment or environmentally sustainable mining. So all those kind of things are starting to impact also. But uh, these laws, even if just proposed still have impact on business and the economy, uh, etc. Okay, so that's just give you some context where we're talking about now. So what is the current situation? Where, we, where do most of us as investors find ourselves? You know, for most um, South African investors, the headline news, as I mentioned just now at the moment, is almost universally bad. You know, we have the, the politics, you know, politically and economically, the country is facing very challenging times, and I think you can't uh, uh, deny that. But these difficulties are not limited to South Africa only. You know, if you look at global economic growth, it's still uh, tepid or lukewarm, um, as well as we have this uh, geopolitical tension all over the world. Um, so we have this high, and, and for a long time, for the last few months, we've been talking about very high levels of uncertainty. And obviously, the uncertainty is leading to volatility, and that's what's shaking us up as, as investors. Um, so that just give you some some background uh, or as an intro. But um, as far as politics go, you know we've uh, we have what's going on inside the ANC, uh, a very divisive um, uh, U.S. election going on at the moment, as well obviously the the, the Brexit. We saw it in, in June, but we're still seeing the consequences of it rolling out. On a macroeconomic side, there are big questions around South Africa's economy, um, which, as I said, is now going through a very tough patch. Um, and uh, we might be staving off a recession, but um, yeah, uh, things are very, um, uh, we're, we're skating on the nice store. Um, the good news, and I'm saying this with tongue in cheek, uh, Zoom has paid up his little portion that's uh, due. Um, we have fresh gold reserves, number, uh, number two, and uh, we have a positive GDP for the for the second quarter. Okay. Um, of these, we still have the situation where the local political landscape, as I mentioned just now, is uh, perhaps the most concerning. While the stakes are high and the outcomes unpredictable, investors, and this is where we're going to get to the nitty gritty, investors should not be making hasty decisions based on the noise alone. Okay. So, you know, while a story might be dominating the headline news, Okay, we see it every single day. Just understand that the market has already discounted, has already priced in the bad news. You know, for example, the sovereign de debt downgrade, and we were talking about Moody's just now. Yeah, to a very large extent, it's already been priced into the market. So there's still going to be a volatility around the actual vent. The big question, and uh, uh, what a lot of us are saying now, is um, will, we be, will, we, will we be downgraded by one notch or two notches? So um, <laughs> that's what the kind of things you have to start thinking about. So that's the one side of the coin, and you can see here in my bottom slide, yeah, 
there could still be a crisis because of the successful attack of, on the integrity of the Treasury and the Reserve Bank. Oh, Proven Gordon, he's been in the, in the news a lot lately. Uh, I've noticed a few the last few days have been quite 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 quiet on that front. But um, uh, it's important to be, and this is to answer the question right at the beginning: how to minimise political risk. To answer that question, it's important to be diversified, to be protected against even the worst possible scenario. And that's the main uh, thrust of today's presentation. So the main point I want you to remember is the world is uncertain and the range of outcomes is wide, but you gain very little by trying to forecast exactly what's going to happen. Now, we're not in the business of forecasting, so the only way you can... Uh, uh, protect yourself is to, as I say, diversify or spread your risk. For example, you know, just to end off with a slide here, Brexit is a, is a case in point, you know, that it was difficult to, to forecast that um, as futile as it could be. Okay, so what's the ideal situation? Okay, so rather focus on trying to make decisions that will give you the best chance of achieving your financial objectives. That's what you want to be focusing on. So this requires taking a long-term view and seeing opportunities beyond the market noise. You know, yes, we've got uncertainty and fear, and we, we, I, I talk about contrarian just now, but uh, you need to be a, bit of a, be a bit of a contrarian because obviously this is where the opportunities come up. You know? So you need to be able to take a long-term view backed up by a long-term process so you need to be patient you can't just you know i'm not, not uh, just ignoring the risks but you need to be adequately protected and that brings to mind warren buffett's uh, uh, number one or he's not his two number his two rules rule number one never lose money rule number two never forget rule number one so that is your main objective as an investor to protect your capital okay so what is uh, the ideal situation to be in the situation where you are not exposed to uh, assets that incur permanent capital losses? That's uh, that's the main thing. So you now we're talking about at the moment there are very real risks in certain assets. You know, we're listing, one asset we're talking about paper assets today, um, the share market and things like that. High quality, especially uh, high quality equities, especially I think uh, our local industrial rand edge stocks are trading at very elevated uh, valuation levels. So the main focus I want to focus here is that, you know, you want to protect uh, your, your investments. That's number one. Number two, um, as I say, is focus on the fundamentals, the building blocks of, of an investment. Now, from, P, from PSG side, we also talk about the three Ms. We talk about the margin of safety. We talk about the moat. And we talk about management. I'm not going to go into, into detail on those now. Obviously, we have spoken about it in the past. Um, in the past webinars, also, I've spoken about focus on quality stocks on the one hand, but also on the other hand, you're also looking for stocks that are undervalued and as well as, uh, as paying a healthy dividend. So that's what I mean by the fundamentals or the building blocks. But also, when this little uh, slide up top here, I'll bring my, my uh, spotlight in. This slide here refers to being unemotional or having no emotions regarding your investments. In other words, being objective. So again, having a long-term view. And this refers to this, having a long-term view and, and seeing opportunities. So by the way, I was, I was talking about these, high, uh, these um, industrial rain edges, I believe having um, um, high valuations. Um, NASPAS, for example, is on a tra is trading on a, a price earnings ratio, price earnings multiple of 106 times. This is until two days ago. Uh, MTN is at 60, 67 times uh, uh, earnings. Breweries is 31. British American Tobacco is sitting on a 21, which is close to what we call fair value. Uh, Richmond has pulled back uh, heavily, but they're still trading on an 18.5 18 uh, PE. And Steinhoff is at 17.86. So, yes, those two are fairly valued. But you can see most of those industrial stocks are pretty uh, uh, valued. So, now, Ownership of these inflated uh, stocks, I believe, uh, proposes or presents the biggest risk to future performance for investors that have these in the portfolio. So just be aware that obviously those stocks can, can pull back and things like that. But saying that, remember, there's also very attractive opportunities in the market, especially 
And, and this information I got from PG Asset Management, the last, uh, I saw an article on, on MoneyWeb. They very much focused on, 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 on local stocks, especially on the banks and the financial sector, as well as our local bonds. They, it was the first time for many years that they actually started to uh, buy into our local bonds, um, adding local South African bonds to the, especially the multi-asset portfolios. Um, that's all the spike in bond yields, obviously having a big impact on the market. It's like a season when we inter uh, yields go up, interest rate, the market comes down and vice versa. But um, the only safe way to negotiate these times, as I say, is to focus on the fundamentals as much as possible. But the main idea with this whole slide here is to have a clear head. Okay, so remember the noise I spoke about just now. You need to think in an unemotional way to try to achieve your 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 investment objectives. Um, I mentioned this now about the contrarian, the contrarian mantra. If you had a look at that way, the slogan. Um, you know, Warren Buffett always says, "Be greedy when your boss is fearful, and be fearful when your boss is greedy." You take it one step further, you say, "Sellers of greed and buyers of fear." That's the way to look at it. So, you know, sell when the crowd wants to buy and buy what the crowd shuns. So, I always, for those of you that are still new to investing in things like it as a novice, I always believe that your first investment in the market is, is always in your knowledge and then obviously applying, uh, applying what you're learning, gain the experience, and that's where the wisdom comes from. So, I hope this slide makes sense to you guys. So, how do we get there? What are we proposing today? Now, we are South African. Let me just get us out of the way. Uh, go back to my normal drawing mode. As, um, as South Africans, we're always juggling the idea that, uh, yeah, if, shall I move my money offshore? Uh, this little ball we're always juggling. Uh, shall I go offshore? And obviously, the recent events over the last few months has made that decision increasingly more important. Um, so, you now the reasons for taking your, 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 your reins offshore has not really changed and I'll, I'll be talking about the three main reasons for taking your money offshore but um, understanding that the main thing is that South Africa uh, contributes only one percent to the global GDP so as a South African investor you're having all 100 percent exposure all your funds exposed to to that market the challenge is that um, you know yeah, South Africans, for for the most part, are are, are, are excellently are, are very well run, but we do not have exposure to to global growth industries, or especially on emerging or established side. So there's a lot of opportunities we're missing out on. You know, share prices rise when the companies grow. When the when the companies grow, um, obviously, yeah, in South Africa, we're seeing number one, the economy, the consumer, and the rand all under pressure. So in that scenario, you know, to grow earnings, or to grow profits, uh, you know, it's, and, and the share price is quite tricky. So that's why we're seeing muted, and you'll see a slide just now, uh, muted stock performances and obviously low growth uh, uh, going forward. Saying that, and this is where I might be standing on some landmines, um, I want to address the, the, the elephant in the room, call it that, RAND depreciation. RAND is historically depreciated against uh, developed, developed uh, markets at the rate of about 6% per annum. Now, last year, we had a bit of a, a hiccup or a bit of a heart attack where the RAND um, fell as much as 30%. Uh, we think back to uh, Nettigate in December. But also, in obviously, uh, pound and euro terms, um, your money has, has, has devalued. So as a South African, you, know, you need to hedge against currency depreciation. While our abilities, look at it this way, while our abilities are priced in developed market countries. In other words, your offshore education uh, for your children. If you want to travel offshore, you want to travel. If you want to, you, you want to buy a German car, you want to buy an American phone. All those things are priced in uh, developed market currencies. So again, uh, we talk about political risk, and I've explained this already. So we talk, we spoke about one way to do it is diversify. So a well-diversified financial portfolio, uh, which includes direct offshore exposure, is one way to protect your, your capital. Okay, so when I say direct uh, uh, offshore exposure, I'm going into more detail just now, but you want to diversify across regions, sectors, and economies. That's one way to reduce your, vol your vulnerability to a currency uh, risk. 
Okay, but saying that, please understand this presentation is not about a rand play, not about about playing the rand. It's nothing to do with it. Okay, so what are we proposing today? There are two options. So um, you know, you can invest in rand denominated. Uh, uh, you got uh, in rand store investing in. Um, uh, randy nominated investment options, and that's why I talk about you're not taking your money offshore, physically taking your money offshore. You're investing in rands, and you're getting paid in rands. In other words, your your your, your investment and your currency exposure is foreign, but every time you sell, it's always in rands. So yeah, we're having options uh, uh, exposure through exchange traded products, through unit trust, and through the asset swap facility. So that's one way of looking at it. Okay. The other way of looking at it is physically taking your money offshore. This is where you go through the exchange control, uh, the process. Um, your first money, this, the, again, you'll see on the next slide, you'll have two options uh, in, in this sense. You've got your 1 million uh, discretionary allowance per adult per calendar year. The, uh, you don't need a tax clearance certificate. Okay. Then the, the option three is where... Um, Private individuals can still take out an additional 10 million um, foreign investment allowance per calendar year, and this is where you do need some uh, a tax clearance from from SARS. But the, yeah, you're opening up an offshore trading account, and obviously you're deciding what currency you want to choose. Okay, so those are the two main options. Think about it: I can take my money offshore, or uh, uh, physically taking it offshore, or I leave it here. Okay. So, what are the benefits of doing this? What are the uh, reasons for doing this? So, you know, South Africa, le mentioned just now, represents less than 1% of the world economy. You're restricting your yourself to domestic assets. You know, for going, um, call it extensive investment opportunities available in other markets. Uh, and yeah, we're talking about, you know, I'm talking about, uh, uh, I think you need to in biotechnology and nanotechnology, for example. We have, but also the companies like Tesla, people, I, companies I admire is Tesla and Apple. And uh, what about um, uh, companies like McDonald's? I saw that uh, President, uh, Deputy President uh, Ramaphosa is, is, is um, selling um, McDonald's. But anyway, imagine having exposure to McDonald's or to credit card companies like MasterCard or Visa. Okay. So, the main idea here is diversification. So that's asset allocation. And remember, today we're just talking about paper assets. Uh, paper assets include shares, uh, unit trust, ETFs, bonds, all that kind of stuff. But it allows you to spread your investment risk across the different economies and different regions. That's the number one reason why you want to go offshore. That's number one. Number two, as I mentioned, uh, having exposure to companies like Tesla and Apple, etc. So access to industries and companies not available here in South Africa. And the third scenario is offshore investments may perform better at times than local investments and vice versa. So it, it depends on global economic conditions and exchange rates. On the next slide, you'll see um, this, is a, uh, this is a snapshot from our daily uh, investment newsletter. But you can see the JSC, or this is the Aussie, Aussie index over the last year. Okay, 4%, 4.33%. Gold sector, yes, there's opportunities there. Gold shares up 112%. Okay, but compare, ignore, ignore the gold, except for gold, look at the average performance of the JSC. Compare that to offshore. The Dow Jones, okay, in dollar terms is up 13%. Uh, the S&P 500, 11%. Uh, NASDAQ, 8%. The S&P, uh, uh, S&P 1, sorry, the FTSE 100 in, in pounds up 16%. Okay, so that's what I mean by performance. And you can also be missing out on that. So, so some of you might be asking now, uh, how can I get exposure offshore? Um, and there's three main ways, obviously through unit trust, exchange traded products, or uh, offshore uh, uh, trading portfolio. But what about RAN hedge stocks? I mentioned just now, um, that a lot of these industrial companies are trading at a very high PE. So yeah, it's just two of them. Yeah, NASPAS, okay, you can see the great performance. Okay, this is over the last four years. Okay, great share performance, but look at the PE ratio. Okay, as I mentioned, very close to uh, over 100 times PE. It's going to take you 100 years to recover the current earnings out of the current share price. So it's high, very highly rated, and you can see the share price there. But I don't think, uh, from a valuation point of view, 
I personally won't get in there because I think it's it's it's, it's expensive. It might be a growth stock, but not a value stock. Yeah, as they say, breweries, and we're seeing what's happening with breweries the last few days with the whole finalization of it. But again, we're talking about around about a 32 PE, not cheap. Okay, so that's answers the question on the ran edges. Okay, especially the ran the industrial ran edges. There might be other opportunities. So yeah, that's one way to get exposure. The other way, as I say, is for unit trust. So if you click on this, by the way, you'll find our link to that on our website, funds A to Z, is through unit trust. This is a passive route. Um, how would you find them? You click on all. So uh, in other words, you look at all those kind of stocks, but I also want to select global. If you click on that and you click on the little button go, uh, it'll spit out a list for you. And this list uh, is only 29. There's only 29 funds that would meet that criteria uh, that is global. What's nice about this now is that you can select the funds that you are interested in, select them by ticking them over here, bring my little curse in again, select the little buttons and compare. You can compare five different funds to each other. So you can compare um, performance and things like that and, and you can click on the link in this situation here and yeah, you look at our, our PSG Global Equity Fund, feeder fund and PSG Global Flexible funds, those are the two that offer the criteria too. And I'll speak, tell you now why you want to look at it. But you click on that little link, it takes you through to, uh, to, the, to, to the fund fact sheets. So you can go dig a bit deeper. An idea there is when you're looking at the fund fact sheets is that, yes, it gives you more information, uh, helps you to look at the past performance. Remember also the disclaimer there, past performance doesn't tell you anything about future performance. But you'll be able to gain more knowledge about the fund itself. Um, but ultimately for you to make well-informed uh, investment decisions. Okay, so why do I say look at our PSG funds? Uh, remember our PSG funds does offer, let's get rid of this again, um, very low fees. You know, if it's a PSG fund, we, there's, there's, uh, the, the uh, ongoing platform fee is only 0.2%. So um, trading platform, low fees, uh, with that 0 0.228, if it's a, a non-PSG fund, it works on a sliding scale, the first one and a half million is 0.5%, with that 0 0.57, and above that, it'll slide down. But um, yes, our training platform offers you the lowest fees, and offers you flexibility, and offers you a wide range of, pro a wide range of unit trusts. You don't have to just stick to PSG, um, but just understand you do get the benefit of the lowest <laughs> available on the platform. But we have over 450 funds to choose from. Okay, so that's one way of looking at it. Uh, another way of getting involved there is through what we call exchange traded products. So uh, which ones will give you exposure? The most common one will come to mind is what they call DBX trackers. Deutsche Bank have, um, have five. So you got the DBX Euro, the Japan, Euro, USA, UK, and World. Um, and then on the ETP side, or sorry, ETN side, um, they have the um, Morgan Stanley uh, ETNs. So you can have exposure to the top 50 companies in Africa, uh, top Chinese companies, top emerging, emerging funds. And then BNB, um, BNP, sorry, Parabas has a range of ETNs also. So you can have exposure to, to Europe or to Asia. So there's a bit of overlap. But uh, why am I saying this? And this is where a lot of guys are starting to look at, at, at ETPs. The advantage here, you know, so people say, gee, I missed the bus. You know, I, could, I should take my money out when it was a 13.50 to the dollar. Um, you know, do I still take my money offshore? So the, the argument is, it's, you know, it, do I play, the, the, as I said just now, it's not a currency play. You know, the, you know trying to predict or time your currency, uh, you know, it's, it's frankly impossible. So, when the rain crashes, we panic and we obviously move money offshore, but when it strengthens, we're too fearful to take money offshore again. Over the last few days, I've noticed that the rain has strengthened. Um, you know, a bit of a uh, contrary when the rain strengthens would be the best time to take your money offshore because why be buying more dollars, more pounds, more euros? But getting back to the slide, yeah, the idea here is set a schedule and work according to a schedule. So in this situation, um, if you had a call it an investment plan, where you have a monthly debit order. So every month when the debit goes order goes off, 
uh, you're buying a set amount every month. So imagine these vertical lines at the end of the month when the debit order goes off, that's your bias. When the, when the fund is low, you're buying more units. When it's slightly a bit higher, you're buying less units, but it's a regular amount. So what they call rent cost averaging. Over a period of time, your cost should, should be lower. Okay, this is looking at uh, DBX World, the DBX uh, tracker, uh, compared to the dollar. So irrespective of what happens with the rent, doesn't matter, but focus more on on the plan than getting your timing right. Okay, I hope that, seems, that slide makes sense to you guys. Okay, so you know, between between 12 rand and 16 rand, that will be your average exposure to offshore. Look at that way. Okay. Let me just get rid of this cursor again so I can move my next slide. Okay, so we have spoken about this in past webinars where we've spoken about exchange traded uh, uh, funds and things like that. This one strategy a lot of people use is to blend the portfolio with ETFs with a share portfolio. Um, this is a hypothetical example where you might take 50% of your funds in the portfolio and divide it between three different um, funds. Now we talk about core. And in satellites, so this is your core, so 50% is in three different ETFs. So for example, you might have 17% uh, in DBX USA, another 17% uh, exposed to, to the, uh, uh, the uh, BNB, uh, P, uh, sorry, BNP Paribus, uh, the, the Guru Asia ETN. You might put 16% into an ETF called New Gold. Now, New Gold is the rand price of gold. And it's just a, a defensive, you know, when the rand, uh, when the when the dollar weakens, or you know, the, the commodities uh, uh, you know, it might be a good opportunity to be involved in, in in gold, and vice versa. And then you might take other fifty percent and divide it by between eight different funds, uh, allocating six and all, or six point two five percent to each one of them. And again, as I say, you might be focusing on quality undervalued shares with shares paying high dividend yields. So this is just a hypothetical example how you would blend this but having exposure to offshore in a local share portfolio. Okay, and then we got our off, uh, the, um, call it offshore option. So option number one is using an asset swap facility. Now, PSG as an asset swap facility, um, which allows you, remember, as, as a unit trust to take money offshore, um, 30% of our funds to be listed offshore. Um, the main thing here is when you do sell, you have exposed, there's no limitation. You can take as much as you want to, but um, any limitation you do have is when you do sell, those funds have to be repatriated back to South Africa in rands. Okay, so that's the one way of having exposure offshore. So you open up an offshore account using PSG's asset swap facility. The second option is, I mentioned just now, is your single discretionary offshore allowance per annum, okay, 1 million. You do not need to get a tax clearance, and this is where you do not want to repatriate money back. So you're converting your rands into pounds and dollars and Hong Kong dollars, and you want to keep it offshore. So that's your option number one. Oh, sorry, option number two when it comes to offshore allowance. Um, option number three, this is over and above your 1 million. Uh, you're allowed to take another additional 10 million. But yeah, you need to get tax clearance and it's a specific tax clearance certificate. It has to have a source logo on it uh, with a specified um, a watermark on it. But also realize it's only valid for 12 months. These things do expire. So those are two ways of looking at it. So what's, what I like about a offshore portfolio um, is that uh, here's an example of a uh, of an offshore portfolio, you can see your holdings and you'll have a facility where you can have a, a detailed view or a consolidated view. Detailed view is, say for example, I bought uh, Microsoft on, on the NASDAQ and I bought Microsoft on the on the DAX, German Stock Exchange. I can have a, a detailed view where I'm looking at different markets and different currencies. I can also have a consolidated view. This is where I consolidate security. So I might have 100 Microsofts on the on the Nasdaq and 100 Microsofts on the on the on the uh, DAX. I consolidate it. I have my 200 shares, and that's a, that's a way of looking at it. So I can see my my holdings first of all, and then secondly, I can see my cash. What's, What's nice about this in different currencies, I can see my balances and things like that. So that's what how you'd manage a offshore account. Let me just look at time quickly. Whoops, we're running by on time here. So let me see what kind of questions you guys have. I'm sorry, I've gone over a bit of time here. I'm getting too excited here. <laughs> okay, let's see what kind of questions. Yeah, so we've still got our sign check here. 
What questions do you guys have? I've answered everybody's questions. Right, short, short, and to the point questions. I uh, we can get get going through it. Hello, any questions? You guys still hearing me? I don't care. No questions, Stuart. I appreciate that. <laughs> Okay. Doesn't look like there's any questions. No, no questions. Thanks, okay. Okay, great, guys. Appreciate that. Okay, let's wrap it up then. So, in conclusion, you know, my objective today was just understand it's not about a currency play. The main benefits for gaining off, uh, offshore exposure is you ought to be diversified, okay, having exposure to sectors that we don't have. Uh, yeah, in South Africa, but also open yourself to opportunities we don't have here. So the four ways, four ways to gain exposure, obviously, is number one, ran edge, just understand that a story in South Africa, unit trust, exchange traded products, and then having an offshore portfolio. Okay, so those are the four ways of getting exposure. So what are your action steps? If you haven't got a, a unit trust or voluntary investment plan with us as yet to have exposure offshore, consider opening up a, a VIP account as well as maybe considering opening up a, a wealth, uh, a PSG wealth offshore account. Just understand also, by the way, the offshore account, especially the uh, investment allowance, just understand there are, and with the asset swap, there are uh, restrictions in the sense that there are minimum requirements. 5,000 pounds for asset swap or a, a investment allowance, a million, uh, sorry, a, a minimum of 100,000. Also understand the brokerage fee is 1%. Um, that's just for the brokerage fee. There's also other costs involved too. But guys, as I say, this presentation will be sent out to you as well as a recording, hopefully either today or tomorrow. But please, if I can ask you guys to complete the survey, give me some feedback, what you guys enjoy, what you don't want, what you want to see more of. Okay. So next week, uh, we'll be talking about um, a cheaper ex ex equity exposure. Um, yeah, we're talking about ETFs. So those of you who are considering ETFs, this is one you, that you want to listen to. The week after that, we talk about uh, having dividends in your portfolio. And then we get into um, old versus new investments, old school versus new school investments. Um, how secure is your financial future? That's the 9th of October. That's the topic. And in the end of October, are you in need of asset, are you in need of asset allocation? Okay. You guys, from my side, thank you very much for being on this webinar again. Uh, thanks for participating. Um, until next week, all the best. Bye for now.